But um, yeah, it's, it's been an incredible time uh, just being with you guys, and, and I've enjoyed being up front and, and sharing God's word with you, but, uh, but I've also enjoyed just uh, sitting at uh, the lunch, dinner, breakfast tables, uh, speaking to some of you guys, uh, some one-on-ones that I've had the opportunity to have. Um, those have been phenomenal. I, I think God, and I believe God, is doing something amazing uh, right here uh, in and through you, and I'm excited to see what that would look like in the years to come. What a great joy uh, to, in a sense, have a front row seat. And I know uh, the leaders here, uh, Jeremiah, Tabelo, um, Ryan, they, they get real front row seats to this. But uh, for the weekend, I get a front row seat uh, to what God is doing uh, in, in many of your lives. Um, and so be encouraged by that. Uh, really be encouraged by that. Life is tough and challenging, um, but God is good. Uh, he is faithful. He loves us more than we could ever imagine. So I want you to leave with that, um, be reminded of it, and hold, hold to it as you navigate through this life. We're going to continue in the book of Ephesians. I hope that it's been um, encouraging and meaningful to you. Um, you're learning something. Uh, that's my desire. That's my hope. I continue to pray that uh, before I come up. Uh, it's always to say, God, would you uh, set me aside, um, and would you uh, take center stage and that folks here, including myself, we would see you for who you are and realize that you're in desperate need of a Savior, and that Savior is you. We're going to jump straight in, um, and we're going to pick up from where we left off yesterday. Um, and so Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and, and like I said in the intro, um, he's writing to us. He's writing to all who would call themselves followers of Jesus. And so these words are for us. Uh, they are words from God to his people. Uh, so Paul begins by unpacking that we have received every spiritual blessing from the heavenly places. All right? And so he walks through those spiritual blessings. And then he reminds us in Ephesians chapter 2 of our identity in Christ by saying that this is who you were. So if you are a Christian here this morning, he says this is who you were, but because of God, because he is rich in mercy, abounding in grace, that he gives us his son, Jesus Christ. And for those who receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, then he says, well, this is who you are now, right? And that has massive implications for who we are. It not only shapes our identity, but it shapes us as a community that molds the way we do ministry. And we saw that uh, in the rest of Ephesians chapter 2, that, that the gospel calls us to live in fellowship with one another. That God is making for himself a family from all people. God is making for himself a family from all people. That is an implication of the gospel. And we have the opportunity, because we live in South Africa, and again, I say this often, but uh, the most diverse country in the world, when you look at its cultures and subcultures, um, those who are formally educated, informally educated, the history of this country, we get the opportunity to put on display God's creative genius. Right? He's forming a family for himself from all people. And then we jumped into chapter 3, where, where Paul goes, it's not, I, I realize that I'm writing this letter to you, that the church in Ephesus at that time, I'm writing this letter to you while I'm sitting in prison. And I know that might discourage some of you. Here you're hearing about this gospel that liberates, that, that brings victory, and yet Paul, you were sitting in jail. He realizes that that might discourage some of them, right? well, maybe the gospel isn't as powerful as Paul makes it out to be. But Paul says, no, 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 don't, don't see it that way. That even though I am sitting in prison, that that is the very plan of God, that God is still at work. If you read the book of Acts, you notice that Paul doesn't just sit in prison going, oh, woe is me, but he uses that opportunity to continue to share Jesus with those around him. It's a phenomenal story. Paul does not waste his life. For many of us, we tend to think, you know what, I'm in a really bad situation, and so only when I'm in a good situation, that's when I'll be able to be effective for God's kingdom. But if we look at the life of Paul, we should see that, no, no, God uses you where you are. Despite your circumstances, God is powerful enough to use you, to put himself on display through your circumstances. And so Paul says that, he says, listen, be encouraged. 
God is still at work. Be encouraged. What I have said to you still remains true, despite the fact that I am sitting here in this prison cell. Be reminded that every spiritual blessing is yours. Those are rich. Be reminded that your identity has now changed. Be reminded that God is forming a family for himself from all people. And so after saying that, Paul then goes into his second prayer. He finds it necessary to go, you know what? I've said a whole lot. I think I need to pray again. I need to lift up all people to God, our Father. And so we're going to pick up from there, from his second prayer. And I'm going to read it to you, but we're going to receive it as a prayer. It will serve as the, the prayer as we jump into our time this morning. But may it serve you in everything that you do. You have been prayed for. That in fact, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. He continues. Think about this for a moment. His service to us doesn't end. It hasn't. He's praying for us by name. Prays for you for your situation. And so I'm going to read Paul's second prayer to us. I'm going to ask that you stand. If you're able to, would you stand with me? as I read this prayer to us. Hear these words of our Father. Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted, shout out to rooted fellowship, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and the width and the height and the depth of God's love. And to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, as we do beautifully read, Ephesians chapter 4 begins with Paul just laboring on what he's already said. He's reminding us of our unity in Christ. He's in a sense repeating himself, adding a little bit of new things here and there, but he's, he's repeating the fact that, hey, be reminded that we are one family. We are one family. And so I'll, I'll read it to you. He then says, therefore, this is Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. There is one. This is why we can come together as a family, because we, we look to the Father, one Father, one hope, one faith, one baptism. This is important for us to understand. Because Paul is about to unpack some things that have implications on us in the way that we function as this family. But he starts by saying, be reminded, one father, one hope, one faith. That even though there is God's creative genius on display, what I like to call the richness of the usness. Mm -hmm. The richness of the usness. 
And it's the gospel that unifies and creates the church. It's the gospel that creates this richness of the usness. And in the richness of the usness, we're going to see now, Jesus gives different gifts that are to be put on display in the family. Why? So that we might experience the richness of the oneness. Did you see what I did there? So, so there's the richness of the usness, and then, and then Jesus gives gifts to the church so that we might experience the richness of the oneness, that everything goes back to Jesus. And so I'm going to read from verse 7 as we talk about these different gifts and why they are given to us. All right. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to the people. Now, now what Paul is doing here is he's drawing from the Old Testament. And so he quotes Psalm 68 verse 18, which says, you ascended on high leading a host of captives in your train, and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. And so he borrows the, the words from the Old Testament because he's trying to tell us something, and you're going to see it in a moment. Verse 9, let's keep reading. For well, what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all the things. I know this may sound somewhat confusing, so let me try to make it clear to us. You see, Jesus gives these gifts. We start here. Jesus gives these gifts, but before we go into these gifts, Paul mentions that Jesus who ascended is the same Jesus who descended. Why? Why is this important for us to know? What does it all mean? See, what Paul is doing is he's giving uh, the imagery of war. That's what he's trying to paint to us. He's trying to paint a picture of war. Paul wants us to see a victorious warrior, a victorious king. He wants us to, to see Jesus as this victorious warrior, this victorious king, marching down the city road in all his splendor and power. And behind him are his captives, his spoils from the war. Paul wants it to be clear that our Lord Jesus is mighty. He is mighty. And that he has captured, he has overcome all our enemies. We need to know this. It's crucial for us to understand this. Paul wants to make sure that we fully grasp this before we get into the gifts and what they all mean. Remember that the one who gives these gifts is a victorious warrior. He's a victorious king. The Lord who gives all these gifts is a mighty Lord who ascended with all authority and power. Paul says that Jesus also descended into the lower places so that you, that you and I, you might have the victory in the lower places as well. Victory is not just in heaven, but it is also down below. This happened when Jesus died on the cross. See, when he died on the cross, Jesus defeated death. He defeated sin. He defeated the power of hell. He defeated Satan. So the image of, that Paul gives us is one of Jesus victoriously walking through the streets with sin, death, and Satan behind him held captive. That is who we serve. That's why the words of Corey Ten Boom are so powerful. Corey Ten Boom says this, There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. 
That is how powerful Jesus is. Jesus' victory on the cross frees us from the bondage of death, sin, and Satan. That if you are a Christian here, that you can lean into the victory of Jesus that has been given and accomplished by the finished work of Jesus. So once Paul has made sure that we understand that the giver of the gifts is all-powerful, after making that clear to us, he then begins to unpack the gifts. Let me say it this way. See, for many of us, what we tend to do is we separate the gifts from the gift giver. We separate the gifts from the gift giver. So what happens is we idolize the gifts and then we believe that these gifts are the things that will give us the victory from sin and death. When in reality, all that they do is point to the one who defeated sin and death. Hmm. We cannot separate these gifts given to us from the Lord Almighty. And so Paul wants to make sure that we understand that. Because in a sense, it's like he knows our hearts. Some of us are sitting here just going, just get to the gifts already. Because <laughs> <laughs> I want to know which, which one do I have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paul knows that. And says, okay, listen, then we, then I'll get to it. But just remember, even as we navigate through these gifts, just remember, it is the Lord God was mighty, was a victorious warrior, king, defeated death and sin. He's the one that gives you this. Now there's so much that could be said about these gifts. There's so much. I mean, there are tons of books that have been written on these gifts and the specifics of these gifts. And we're going to get into that. We won't go deep, but we'll get into most of it. So much has been written. But having said that, I don't want you to miss two important things. In fact, if you're taking notes, I'll ask that you write this down because it's going to come up as we make our way through this passage. I don't want you to miss two things. The first is, I want us to see the diversity of these gifts. All right, the diversity of these gifts. I want you to miss that. And then connected to that, which is our second point, is the display of the gifts. The display of the gifts. Notice the variety of the gifts that Jesus gives to the church. And then also notice that they are to be displayed in the church. That's what I mean by those two points. The diversity of the gifts and the display of the gifts. Let's read verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some translations say shepherds, and teachers. Now I know already some of you are like, ooh, apostles and prophets. <laughs> and like I said before, I, I, could, I, could, I could literally sit and, and unpack this for hours, but let me be brief. As we navigate through the scriptures and as we study the scriptures, I have come to this conclusion, and many others, who are far more clever than I could ever be, that when we see apostles and prophets in the scriptures, we, we see them as offices, right? As, as titles, if you will. And that those offices no longer exist today. And so when so-and-so says, no, I am apostle this, or I am prophet this, that according to scripture, that is incorrect. Because that office no longer exists. Now you might be sitting here and going, well, how do you know? And I would say, great question. <laughs> I like scripture to interpret scripture. Hmm. Right? I love it when, when script, scripture has the ability to do that. Scripture can unpack scripture. Now, I think it's a good thing when you read a passage and go, you know, what does this mean? And then ask the person, so what do you think? And what do you think? And I want to hear you out. That's important. But more importantly is to always come back to the Bible and say, well, what does the Bible say? 
it's good that you say that and you think that and you feel that. But what does the, the Bible say? Because if I told you, if I stood here over the weekend and just gave you what I think, we would be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> we really would. And so let scripture interpret scripture. So why would you say that the office, right, the office, the title of apostle and prophets has no longer existed? Why, why, where do you get authority to say that? Well, in the book of Ephesians, if we go back a few chapters, chapter 2 to be specific, here's what Paul says. In talking about our unity, I'm going to read from verse 19. He writes, So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Okay, cool, get that. We are one family. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. So Christ Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the one that holds this all together. If you think of architecture, the cornerstone is, is that important, crucial, necessary piece of a building that keeps it all together. Without it, everything that you build will crumble. And so that is, that is Jesus. And then on top of that, you have the foundation that has been laid on by the apostles and prophets. That would be Paul and John, and Peter, and then the prophets of the Old Testament. See, they, they, they didn't have the Bible the way that we had. That God would communicate through them to us so that we might know who he is. But as we look in the New Testament, we see that the apostles and prophets, they, look, we use what they were doing as the foundation that has now been laid, Jesus being the cornerstone. And then we're going to see now, all that we do today is build upon that foundation. That there is no need to lay down more foundation. That what we have is complete. That there is no need to add to this. And anyone who comes and says, listen, I have another revelation that is separate from this. Well, that is not God. Because if we read the scriptures, and the scriptures say it as well, that, that all that we need is here, that this in of itself is perfect. Now you might say, well, what about commentaries and other books? No, those are tools that come alongside the Bible to just kind of help us understand it. But they are not the Bible. They are not the Word of God. And so once that foundation had been laid, once this is now complete and we, we have it, we have access to God's word spoken to us, then there is no need for the office of apostles and prophets because the foundation is done. Mm. Now, much more could be said about this. And I would love to answer your questions. Now, I believe that there's going to be some time towards the end of our weekend where we can dialogue a little bit, and I'm happy to go into that. But, but for now, I'm going to leave it there, right? Let scripture interpret scripture. Jesus is the cornerstone. The apostles and prophets lay the foundation. That foundation is now set. What we do is just build upon this foundation. And to that building, Jesus gives gifts. He gives gifts. And so I now see apostles and prophets, not as offices, but as gifts, that we can function from that gift. Let me explain. Apostles. Apostles literally means the sent out ones. They were considered the visionaries, the pioneers. They were the ones who planted churches, who started new ministries the ones who created innovative ways of spreading the gospel, seeing the gospel move through society and culture. That was their gift. They were always looking for new ground, new territory. They were never comfortable with the status quo. That's the, the gift of the apostles. Not the office, but the gift that Jesus gives to the church. That is necessary. Why? Because we need to start new churches and new ministries. Now, what's happening here is incredible. Wouldn't you love to see TBT started somewhere on some campus where this does not exist? 
And so Jesus then gives the gift of apostles so that they might be pioneers and start new work. But he also gives prophets. A prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of God and interprets his will. It's not telling something new. We have everything that we need to know here. But rather illuminating something that has always been. Unpacking the word of God. Speaking truth boldly. Oftentimes rebuking and giving correction. That's what prophets did. And so those who have the gift of the prophet, is, it's, it's like those who preach the word of God. They unpack what God has already said, and then they herald it, they proclaim it, unapologetically. He also gives evangelists. These individuals were the ones who wanted to tell people everywhere about the good news of the gospel. Those are folks who just want to go to places and like, man, how are you? Good to meet you. I'd love to talk to you about Jesus. <laughs> they use every opportunity to talk about Jesus. They have what we in Acts 29 call a missional pulse. And every time they're sitting in a meeting, they're just going, okay, this is great, this is great, but how are we going to get them to hear about Jesus? What are some things that we can do to get them to hear about Jesus? He gives to the church shepherds, pastors, and teachers. Uh, some of these in the same group, but they are different. Shepherds are the ones who nurture and take care of the people of God. And teachers are the ones who instruct, who, who break down the word of God into bite-sized pieces so that we might take it and begin to apply it to our lives. Five different gifts. And they are amazing. They are amazing. Now here's the thing about these gifts. They were not created to operate on their own. Sin, however, wants us to believe that that's the case. In fact, sin wants us to compare our gifts with one another. Going, oh, you, you got which one? Oh, so, so much better. <laughs> Gosh, I wish I had that one. And so we become envious of others' gifts, believing that they are better than the ones that God has given us. The other danger that we run into is that we, we, we tend to kind of isolate ourselves from God's variety, and then uh, the, the shepherds just hang out with the shepherds, and the teachers just hang out with the teachers, and the apostles just with the apostles. Why? Because, well, we're similar, it's just easier. This goes back to Ephesians chapter 2. But the body of Christ needs all the gifts to flourish. I mean, if we just had evangelists, it'd be great. I could be sharing Jesus everywhere and watching people come to faith, and then what? These people need to be cared for. They need to be loved. They need to be taught. They need to have God's word communicated to them, heralded, proclaimed. I mean, if we just have apostles, then we'd just be starting things, and then once it's up and running a little bit, we're like, okay, cool, I'm out, I'm going to start something else somewhere else. No, hold on. <laughs> it's like leaving a three-year-old to fend for themselves. As a staff team at Rooted Fellowship, uh, we are five individuals, and, and we're kind of walking through trying to understand what our gifts are so that we might serve the church well. And so I have somewhat of the apostle, prophet, right? That's kind of my gift leaning. I think God's gifted me that way. What does that mean when it comes to shepherding? Even though I'm called to do it, I'm really horrible at it. And so we have a guy on our team called Jono, and he's just wired to shepherd. Absolutely loves it, and he's so gifted at it. And so as I think about, well, let's start this and this new innovative way of doing this and let's plant this church, 
I need Jono to come alongside me to go, okay, hold on, as we get these folks to come in, as CEO of who many of you might know, we're realizing he has a kind of an evangelistic gift. He's just going, man, let's be missional and let's share Jesus. And so people are coming. Well, someone needs to take care of these people. Someone needs to be thinking how to shepherd and nurture and care for them well. The people of God need all the gifts. They were never meant to be lived out in isolation. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he gave out gifts so that the earth might be filled with his glory. And so the question this morning is, are you using your gifts? Maybe let's take a step back. Are you even aware of what your gifts might be? You see, when you don't use your gifts, Not only do you miss out on what God has in store for you, but we, as the community, as the church, we miss out. It affects the family. It affects the team, if you will. The church needs you. It needs your gift. And Jesus has created his church to function this way. Look with me in verse 12. These gifts are given for the equipping, equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. This word equip means to make someone completely adequate or sufficient for something. Other commentators on this say that you can interpret the word equip from the original language in the Greek of of like setting, the setting of a bone is a medical term. The correcting of a bone, when your your bones go out of place, you need the doctor to put it back in place. It's the setting of that bone. Which can be understood as repairing or restoring. So these gifts are given to, to make us somewhat complete, but also for the repairing and the restoring of the body. They are given to the church so that we might be prepared and repaired. Prepared and repaired. I'll come back to that in a moment. Why is Jesus doing all of this? So that we might have unity in the faith. Remember where he started, one father, one baptism, one hope. So that we might have unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son. We see this in verse 13. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. We are unified in the faith. And we have to acknowledge that this unifying only happens because of Jesus. This unifying is a God thing. It's a God thing. It requires God and it requires His plan. And He's telling us what His plan is to unify us. I love the South African Constitution. As one who studied it, I believe it's one of the best constitutions in the world. It has its flaws, but it's incredible. And even that, for some reason, as you see, doesn't unify us. From it, they've built some pretty impressive legislations. Even those don't Unifies. We need a God supernatural work to unify us. And, and, and that happens with Jesus. And then Jesus says that, that this is how it's going to work. This happens, and when it happens, verse 14, then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning and cleverness in the techniques of deceit. Paul says we need each other. We need each other to be operating in our gifts under the lordship and submission of Jesus. Because when we are on our own, it is like we are left in the cold wilderness. Left for dead. That it's so easy for sin to, to enter in and to deceive us. We need to be in community and and the community operating out of its gifts so that we might grow to maturity, so that we are no longer like little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching. 
He's not just saying that community is necessary. Paul is saying that community is vital. It is vital. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, it's all of us, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. For some reason, we today have made the church a spectator sport. We see God's people sitting in the stands with a few individuals playing on the field. That's not Jesus' plan. Jesus says that we are all players. If you are a Christian, you are a player on the field and you have been given some gifts to use. And that the world, those who don't know Jesus, they are the spectators. They are the spectators looking and watching us engage with one another. And as we do so in unity, it should cause them to go, man, that looks interesting. How is it that they're able to do that? How are they operating together in unity? It will cause them to look at their own current situation and their own lives and go, you know what, I, I want in. How do I get to play? And our answer should be, Ask the owner. He's the one that deals with all the contracts. If you want to be on the field, you need to speak to the owner. He, he, he works with all the contracts. And the amazing thing about the owner is that he doesn't require you to be fit. Because I know some of us might go, I want to really play, but I think I first need to go get fit. The owner doesn't require you to be fit. Because he knows that that will never happen. If you're trying to figure out who the owner is, let me be clear. The owner is Jesus. <laughs> See, Jesus is the one that makes you fit by giving you himself. And then he places you in community where we together will figure out it's in community that you become fit. Jesus wants you to be spiritually fit. And he does that by placing you in community so that you might know and experience true love and true joy. And all you have to say is yes to the invitation of the other. Because he says, come and play. Stop sitting on the stands and come to play. I have given you some gifts that are beneficial to the growing of this community, this team. And all you have to say is come and play. Let me close by, by saying this real quick. I, remember I said to you that these are given so that we might be prepared and repaired. That we might be prepared for Jesus' coming, where he will come and make all things new. That that time is closing. We heard this last night from Andy, right? That this time is closing. So we need to be prepared for Jesus' second coming. And that is coming to Jesus, but it's also so that we might be repaired that we might become spiritually fit, that we might be restored, that we might be renewed. <clears throat> and that happens in the context of community as we exercise our gifts, as we love one another. And, and so I'll be, I'll be brief in closing to show you this preparedness and us being repaired. Paul writes this, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17 says, Therefore I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer live as Gentiles live in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the darkness, the hardness of their hearts. They become callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. But, verse 20, and that is not how you came to know Christ, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Take off your former way of life. Take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And then put on the new self. 
the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of truth. And when you are in community, to enter into this community, one has to take off the old self. It's like taking off these old clothes, allowing the gospel to transform you and renew you and shape you. And then you put on the new self. Put on new clothes. You get a brand new wardrobe. When you come to Jesus, you get a brand new wardrobe. Put on. Put on the new self. But what is this new self? Well, it's putting on Jesus. It's putting on Jesus. The new identity. Remember the two words in the Greek for new? This is kainos. You're not getting an upgrade. It's a complete transformation. And then as we await Jesus' return, because we live in a broken and sinful world, we're constantly having to, to remind ourselves, no, 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 this is not the right way. Because I'm tempted to go back to the rubbish bin to go pick up that old jacket that I thought was cool. When Jesus says, I've given you a brand new wardrobe, just go to your wardrobe and put on. Because he goes into a list of things, and I'm not going to read them, but he goes into a, a, a list of things that we should stop lying and speak the truth. That, that be angry, but do not sin. Don't steal. Don't use foul language. Do not grieve God's Holy Spirit. Do away with bitterness and anger and wrath. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another. You, you know when I operate like this? It's when I'm daily putting on Jesus. I have the new wardrobe. I just need to daily put on the clothes that Jesus has given me. And not be tempted to go back to the rubbish bin to pick up the old stuff. That is not me anymore. Put on forgiveness. Put on love. Put on kindness compassion. And if we are on our own, it's so much easier to go, you know what, this is really tough, I can't do this anymore. You have no idea what they did to me. I am going back to put on that jacket, because that jacket has vengeance written all over it. <laughs> when we are operating out of one another's gifts that God has given us to put on display, we can quickly go, hey, hold on, that's not what the Bible says. I'm going to stop you at the door, go back to your room, open the cupboard. There is forgiveness. There is kindness. God gives us a variety of gifts to be put on display, to prepare us, to restore us, to renew us, so that we might be all that Jesus has called us to be as we await his return.